In Romans 11.32, Paul reaches uh, the pinnacle of his theological treatise explaining the nature of reality. And so 11.32, he writes this. God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And then next verse, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul tells us what to do. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the compassions or mercies of God, to present your bodies a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your logical worship service. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, by living this out, you may discern what is the will of God, the good, the pleasing, and perfected, the finished. And then for the rest of chapter 12, it's like Paul is describing the will of God, not prescribing the will of God. It's like he sees the will of God incarnate. Paul saw him on the road to Damascus, and the experience utterly violated his psyche. He lost his life and found it. And Paul must have seen him when he was caught up to the third heaven, which he describes in 2 Corinthians, when he was caught up to paradise and heard words that he just couldn't put into words. Paul saw, I think, what Isaiah saw when Isaiah was called to preach in Isaiah chapter 6. Paul saw what my daughter saw many years ago one night during worship. As I told you last time, out of the silence, in the car on the way home, she said, and she was like 14 at the time, she said, Dad, I saw something tonight during worship when people were coming forward for communion, these like cutter things came out of the walls and started like cutting off people's arms and legs and heads and stuff. And when I expressed concern about that, she said, oh, but Dad, you gotta understand it was, well, it was kinda, it was kinda cool. Cause after the cutters would like cut off their arms and legs, these people would like hop up, hobble up to the communion table, take communion, and then when they'd hobble around the table, they'd bump into each other. And when they bumped into each other in the place that they'd been cut, they would like, they would fuse. And they all like bumped into each other and fuse until they formed this one huge man that could not be hurt and so would never be afraid. See, I think she saw the will of God, the good, the pleasing, and the perfected. She saw the Superman, the eschatos Adam, the image of God. She saw us on the other side of the curtain. She caught a glimpse of the glory of God. The glory of God is man fully alive, wrote Irenaeus around 180 AD, not men, but, but man, Adam. She saw this. <laughs> or maybe I should say what this is trying to represent or portray. We're each like one of these, one of these vessels, remember uh, from last time? One of, the, like this PVC pipe that I ask you to think of as an earthen vessel. We're each like one of these, but deceived by a lie, we each take knowledge of the good, right? So that we can make ourselves good. But when we do that, it's like the good dies and we don't fill ourselves with the good, we end up filling ourselves with the selves, which makes us like earthen vessels full of earth. You remember how this was packed with earth at the ends last time? Makes us full of ourselves and you see, I think that's a vessel of wrath. And then in shame, we cover ourselves with more of ourselves, with more clay, just like Adam and Eve covered themselves, you remember, in fig leaves and the works of the flesh. 
Paul told us this earlier in chapter 1. The wrath of God is revealed against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who imprison the truth, and you know who the truth is, in the chains of their own unrighteousness. You see, the truth, who is the life, is somehow imprisoned in the soul of every sinner. And that just ticks God off. <laughs> it, it invites God's wrath, maybe I should say. So when the Word of God spoken to us as gospel, and the Word of God implanted within us like a seed draws us back to the tree and to the throne, then the Word cuts us to the division of soul and spirit. That's the division of human flesh and the life of God, the division of Mises and Jesus. I've been talking about that for a year. So last time I took a big knife like the ones, you know, that the priests had in, in the temple, and I cut away the clay from these vessels that I had filled with clay and then encased in more clay, and with that judgment, I turned these vessels of wrath into vessels of mercy. Then we took these vessels and we constructed, we, we put together this, uh, this body, Noting that we all connect at the point of the wound, the place where we bleed. In other words, not our strengths, but our weaknesses. That decision to bleed is called faith, hope, and love, and it doesn't come from us. It's the logic of God to bleed the life of God. The life is in the blood, but the life is trapped in death whenever a member of the body refuses to bleed the life that is, refuses to, to love. A living body is a communion of faith, hope, and love, the sacrifice of self. So life is not the survival of the fittest. Life is literally the sacrifice of the fittest. Life is losing yourself and finding yourself all in the same moment. So life is eternal. In other words, this is the way things are on the other side of the curtain. The curtain which separates this age, this Ion, from the age to come, that which is Ionios, eternal. In other words, this is reality. And we are all dead and insane <laughs> until we see it. Until, in the words of Paul, we discern the body, the body of Christ. So Paul just told us be transformed, metamorpho, by the uh, renewal, be metamorphosed by the renewal of your mind. He didn't write, be transformed by, you know, getting more knowledge, reading more books, and trying harder. Actually, that was Satan's suggestion to Eve and Adam in the beginning, remember? People, people always want to know. If you're a pastor, you know this. People always want to know, what does God want me to do? I'm a people, so full disclosure. If you were to listen to my prayers for the last, I don't know how long I've been praying, 58 years. I started praying at three, I think, but uh, that long. Uh, you would uh, discover that 99% of my prayer life has really been just one question, and that is, Jesus, what the hell do you want me to do? Jesus is so patient, over and over he reminds me, Peter, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul, and I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. So I say, oh, uh, okay, so how do I do that? And who's my neighbor? Is Brett my neighbor? So you come up here, Brett. You just come up here, stand next to me. This is Brett standing next to me. And so Brett is my neighbor, because that's what neighbor means, the person next to you. So you're surrounded by, surrounded by neighbors. So you just stay here, neighbor, while I talk about you. Have you ever wondered how do I love God with all that I am and all that I've got, 
and have anything left over with which to love my neighbor. You see, it's impossible to love God with all I've got and then to love my neighbor as myself unless God is in my neighbor and in myself. And you see, that is exactly what Paul is telling us. Love is not a law. Love is a life which flows from the throne and through you into your neighbor and then back to you uh, and back to the throne. And so you don't then idolize your neighbor because I know that's all tempting to do. That's tempting to do with Brett, to idolize Brett. But you love God in your neighbor even as they love God in you. When that happens, we all lose our lives and find them in this happy communion that is the body of Christ. And then it's easy for me to love my neighbor as myself, for I know that my neighbor is myself. Brett is me, and me is he. He's literally my blood brother. And I am really just uh, incredibly grateful for Brett. <laughs> now, I'm sure that this would never happen, so this is entirely, completely hypothetical, okay? And I'm, I'm thinking probably Heather and Bailey and Lily would agree, yeah, that is entirely hypothetical, uh, Peter. But just what if? What if one day Brett was just, you know, kind of a little hard to love? Well, that would make me kind of angry, Brett. Fill me with a little bit of wrath. Maybe wrath is like love that gets, you know, bottled up, maybe. You know, for 1,500, year, or 1500 years now, ever since the church really became part of the Roman Empire, most church leaders have argued that some people are vessels of wrath and other people are vessels of mercy. Some argue that people are chosen for this. Others argue that people choose to be this vessels of wrath. But either way, both of those would argue that God made some people knowing that they would suffer endless torment as vessels of wrath, only wrath. And yet Paul has gone to incredible lengths, 11 chapters in Romans so far, to make just the opposite point, that God consigned all to disobedience, that's a vessel of wrath, in order that he might have mercy on all, and what would that be? Well, that would be a vessel of wrath that has now somehow become a vessel of mercy. And now sometimes people will say to me, because this has been a lot of trauma, why does that really matter, Peter? What difference does that make? It's just, you know, it's just theology. I'm kind of into psychology, sociology, all the other ologies, but theology is just theologos, just the logic of God, just the word of God, just the psyche of Jesus. So what difference does it make if I'm trying to love Brett? What if there's a chance, just a chance, that Brett is only a vessel of wrath? I mean, just look at him. What if? Yeah. Well, I would certainly think twice about loving Brett as I love myself, for fear that myself might be joined to Brett, a vessel of wrath. So, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to weep with Brett when he's weeping. I wouldn't want to rejoice with Brett when he's rejoicing. I'd act like I love Brett because love is the law. I mean, we both work at a church. Love is the law. I gotta do that. But my heart would be far, far, far from him. And what if there's a chance that I am just a vessel of wrath? If there's a chance that I'm a vessel of wrath and Brett is not a vessel of wrath, then I would be utterly threatened by Brett. And I would secretly compete with Brett in fear that I'll be judged by Brett. I'll have to stand next to Brett at the judgment. I'd be terrified to be different than Brett or less than Brett. And yet I'll secretly hate Brett, who I'm trying to be. That's a conundrum. I'll hate his talents. I mean, Brett, geez, Brett, like, he plays the drums, he can preach, and he does business. I mean, programs and all, all that stuff. I mean, I'll hate his talents and his gifts, and most of all, I hate his kindness. For I'll perceive all of it as condemnation of me, 
right? Because we're competing. Not a blessing, but a curse. I'll act like I love Brett while I secretly wish Brett to hell. All in the name of, of heaven. See, if there's even a chance that some people are vessels of wrath, just some, then I'm going to have to judge everyone before I love anyone. And yet, according to Romans 2, 1, to judge anybody makes me guilty of the very thing I'm attempting to judge. Original sin is attempting to judge, to take knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's taking knowledge of the good and so crucifying the good and making myself evil and so trying to love what happens. I can't love, I crucify love, so love is not a life but just more law entombed in the dungeon that I think of as me. I become an imitation Christ, literally an antichrist spawning other anti-Christians who dress like Jesus and hate like hell and I'm filled with wrath. I'm filled with wrath. Why? Well, because I secretly hate God for what kind of God commands me to love my enemies and then endlessly tortures his own enemies. One of which I'm secretly convinced is me. So you see, yeah, it makes a difference what I see on the other side of the curtain. So thank you, Brett. You may sit down, but you, you stay up front here in case I decide. In case I decide to make a spectacle of you later in this sermon. Romans 12, 2. So Paul writes, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And now Paul isn't just giving us more laws. He's spent 11 chapters arguing that we can't be justified by works of the law. He's not giving us more laws. He's giving us a new vision. He's describing life on the other side of the curtain, the age to come. So if what I read now doesn't describe you, you mustn't simply try harder. You must present your psyche, your psychologos, as a sacrifice and be transformed by the theologos, the head of the body, the psyche of Jesus. Now, there are hundreds of sermons, let me just say real quickly, that we could preach from Romans chapter 12. But I'd just like to read all of chapter 12, for it seems that we've chopped it up into hundreds of little pieces, and we've missed the picture that Paul is painting. And we're still, we've missed the point that Paul is making. Verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, or in you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. We talked about all this last time. Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having charisma or gifts that differ according to the charis, the grace given to us. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who dares acts of mercy with cheerfulness, the love genuine. Now, let me just mention the words in brackets are the more literal translation. And there are a lot of words in brackets uh, today for the translator has added 23 <laughs> I counted them, 23 imperative verbs that aren't in the text. Im imperative means command, but Paul, you see, is not prescribing law, the imperative. Paul is describing a revelation, not prescribing law, describing a revelation, the way things are in reality, and that is an apocalypse. The love genuine, abhorring the evil, being joined to the good, and we know who that is, in the brotherly love in one another, lovingly affectionate, in showing honor, outdoing one another, which means competing at putting other people first, in the zeal, not slothful, in the spirit, fervent, in the Lord being servant, in the hope, rejoicing, in the tribulation, enduring, in the prayer, constant, in the needs of the saints, sharing, hospitality, 
pursuing, and now he switches to the imperative, bless those who are persecuting you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. To rejoice with the rejoicing, to weep with the weeping, thinking yourself the same into one another, thinking yourself not the high, but being led away, associating with the low. Never be wise in yourselves, repaying no evil no one evil for evil, providing good in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, being at peace with all men, all men, not avenging yourselves, beloved, but give space to the wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by the evil, but overcome the evil with the good. Now, some will say Paul can't actually literally mean this. If he really did this, you'd get yourself crucified. <laughs> and if you got yourself crucified, Everything that you have worked for would be sacrificed. Paul can't mean this, they say. Even God doesn't do this, they say. That's an important point. Does God bless those who persecute him? Does God weep with those who weep? How about those who weep and gnash their teeth in outer darkness? If hell is endless, then heaven would be endless weeping, right? He says weep with those who weep. It would be endless weeping for God and endless weeping for us if we wept with those who wept. Does God, and this is a fascinating phrase the way Paul does it in the text, does God think himself into others? What a thought. And yet Paul says that we have the mind of Christ. Does God think himself the high? In other words, is God proud? I know he gets that, he gets pegged with that. Is God proud? Or does God associate himself with the low? Is God humble? Is God wise in himself? Or is he the, he's the wisdom in all? Does God repay evil with evil? You know, many people, I think most people say, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You commit some temporal evil here and God will repay you with endless conscious torment there, which to me sounds like repaying a little evil with like infinite evil, which sounds, I don't know, like a victory for the evil. Does God provide good for all? Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. The Lord is kind in all his works. Psalm 145. Does God work for peace with all men? I've been told, well, it's really only a few men, and with others, it's just the opposite. I've been told that he was the prince of peace, you know, the first time around, but you wait till he comes back the second time around. Then he'll just kick your butt. Totally different. He who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does God feed his enemies and give them drink? In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, Love your enemies, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So is God overcome by the evil, or does God overcome the evil with the good? <laughs> so what is the good? I mean, that is actually what Adam and Eve wanted to know. And that's what we all want to know, and that's what we we're all coming to know, or perhaps I should say that's the good who has come to know us. Any Christian theologian will tell you Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God, and Jesus is the ultimate revelation of man. That's us. The ultimate revelation, the perfect image of the invisible God, the eschatos man. He is who we are on the other side of the curtain. 
the incarnation of love, walking, talking, kindness, goodness. So how do you explain this sentence? Verse 19, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And then to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Right off the bat, I need to mention that to the contrary is one word in Greek. It's a conjunction, the conjunction Allah. It shows up 638 times in the New Testament. And this is the only place that the ESV translators have translated it to the contrary. Implying that vengeance is the opposite of kindness, because they can't perceive that they could somehow be the same. And so we are being commanded to do the opposite of God, our Father. Usually Allah is translated but, but it's also translated moreover, indeed, and even yes. So Paul writes, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, but moreover, indeed, yes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Be kind to him. Vengeance is the Greek word ekdikesis. Avenge is the Greek verb um, ek dikeo. Ek means from or out of. Dike means just or, or right. And dikaio means to justify or make right. It's to fix something. So vengeance means to make right and so fix what is wrong. God doesn't make things right by doing what's wrong. So maybe God destroys enemies by making them friends, in the words of Abraham Lincoln. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, is a quote from the Song of Moses. But you remember uh, Moses told Israel to sing when they had failed to obey the law in the foreign land to which he prophesied they would be exiled. It's really amazing. He gives them the law, he says, you're gonna screw all this up, and then you're gonna be hundreds, of, and then you're gonna sing this song. Deuteronomy 32, 34, they were to sing, is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries, my treasury. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Through Paul, we've learned that only God can pay for all things are from him, through him, and to him. We took the life from the tree in the garden. We must return the life to the tree in the garden. But even that decision to do so is a gift given to us called, called faith. The Song of Moses then ends with this line, which Paul's soon gonna quote in chapter 15. Rejoice, O Gentiles, that's O nations, all you non-Jews, with his people, that's the Jews, which you see, if you do the math, that means everybody rejoice because everyone's his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. And so according to the song, remember this what we read, vengeance is mine, I will stored up in my treasuries. Vengeance is laid up in God's treasury. And check this out, it was in the treasury in the temple, according to John 8, that Jesus said, I'm the light, the light of the world. And then he spoke about judgment, not as if he was going to judge, but as if he himself were the judgment. And so I hope you get this picture. The body of Jesus is the temple, that's what he said, and his life is like the treasure in the treasury of the temple. So when we broke his body, vengeance poured out. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot conquer it or overcome it. This is the judgment, the light has come into the world, said Jesus. So at the tree in the garden, we took his life, and that's evil. And at the tree in the garden, he gave his life, and that's good. And when this comes to light, it destroys all, 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 all of our arrogant illusions. So what's my sin? What's every sin? What's my sin? It's this. And what's God's vengeance? <laughs> Bleeding for me. The vengeance of God is absolute kindness. It's the treasure in the temple. It's the blood that is wine and the wine that is blood. It's the passion of God. It's the wrath of God. 
that avenges evil, but not with more evil, but only with absolute and unmitigated good, the good. Jeremiah 30, uh, 24. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back, check this out, until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind and his heart. What are God's intentions? Let us make Adam humanity in our own image and likeness. Until he has accomplished the intentions of his mind and his heart, in the latter days you will understand this. In the Revelation, the seven angels, they come out of the temple of God and they pour bowls of wrath on the earth. They burn away the great harlot. That's the old Jerusalem that had a transactional relationship with God and they reveal the bride. <laughs> The new Jerusalem coming down, the wrath in the bowls is the blood of the Lamb standing on the throne for he has conquered all things and ransomed humanity for God. He is the vengeance of God. Paul has been quoting Isaiah throughout Romans. Jesus quoted Isaiah basically like all the time. In his hometown synagogue, he quoted Isaiah 61.1. Uh, through two. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's the Jubilee when all the debts would be forgiven, which is pretty good news if you're a debtor and think you can't pay. Pretty bad news if you're a lender and you think everybody should pay. Jesus announced the year of the Lord's favor. The next line in Isaiah is, and the day of the vengeance of our God. But Jesus didn't say that second part. But that's not because he wasn't proclaiming the day of vengeance, it's because people did not understand that absolute forgiveness is absolute vengeance on the psyche of man. The self-centered psyche of fallen man. On the day of vengeance, at the edge of time and eternity, Jesus cried, Father, forgive them. And when I see who it is and what it is he's talking about, well, I'll never be arrogant again. <laughs> and I'll never be alone again. At the end of Isaiah, all humanity walks out to the edge of the New Jerusalem and they look down on the corpses, the flesh of all humanity being consumed in the valley of Gehenna. It's this incredible scene. And then as one body in new flesh with one mind, they all praise God for saving them from that, themselves. They are humanity on the other side of the curtain. At the beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter six, in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah died because he approached the throne of mercy, the mercy seat, in arrogance. And it was like the glory of God literally ate away his flesh. They call it leprosy in the text, but that's, they mean any kind of skin-eating disease. That year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple. He sees God in a body. Who's that? <laughs> well, that can only be Jesus. And Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. The seraphim cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled, is filled, is filled with his glory. Think that one through. And it can only mean that Isaiah saw all things filled with God through Christ Jesus and all things united in him in one body. He saw Ephesians 1.10, the plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. He saw what Paul saw and John saw and even my daughter saw that night all those years ago coming home from church. He, he, he saw the other side of the curtain. One eternal communion of sacrificial ecstatic love that would have necessary, necessarily included Isaiah and King Uzziah and you. Now that's the part that we usually sing about in church, right? But we often don't sing what happens next. 
Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, for I am lost. That Hebrew word translated lost is also translated utterly cut off, undone, perished, and most often destroyed. Isaiah's psyche is literally destroyed by the revelation of the psyche of God. Woe is me, for I am lost, a man of unclean lips and a people of unclean lips. That is, I'm a man that's believed the lie among other people that have believed the lie and then perpetuated the lie. We have each believed the lie and so taken the life, called it our own, and so assumed that everything is about this illusion that I call me. In an instant, Isaiah sees that even me is a constant gift of he, the one on the throne. He's the good in every moment. He's the life in every breath, the beauty in every sunset, every flower, beauty in every sip of wine. And so I am not my own. I am the constant expression of the kindness of God, and anything else is just an arrogant temporal illusion. One of the seraphim flies to Isaiah with a coal from the altar, touches it to Isaiah's lips, declaring, your sin is atoned for. So listen closely. It's the coals on the altar that burn away the flesh of the sacrifice. And it's our flesh, our flesh, that only feels its own pain, only suffers its, its own pain and feels its own pleasure. It's our psycho-logos, uh, our psyche, the psychicos body, our ego that traps us in ourselves and so damns us to hell, and so the burning coals are the kindness of God that set us free, free to love and be loved, free to lose our lives and find them, free to let the life of God flow from us, through us, and then back to us. Jesus said there's one sin that will not be forgiven. <laughs> and it seems abundantly clear to me that the unforgivable sin is unforgiveness. You said that, unless you forgive, you won't be forgiven. So if you ever say, look, I cannot forgive, well, you're, don't say that. <laughs> Jesus also called it the blasphemy of the Spirit. Paul told us that the Spirit is life, and we know the life is in the blood, and we are justified by his blood flowing through us like a river. So what is the blasphemy of the Spirit? Well, isn't it to hang on to the life as if it were your own? and not God's life? Isn't it to be forgiven the life and then refusing to forgive the life to others? Isn't it to make yourself a blood clot, a vessel of wrath? It's damming the river of life. And so what's the vengeance of God upon a sinner like me? Well, it's to bleed for me. And the blood reveals the truth. And it's the truth that cuts the division of soul and spirit, that cuts Mises from Jesus like I cut the clay from the earthen vessels in the last sermon. And it's the love that then fills them with the life and binds all things together in one in the psyche of God, the body of Christ, now rising from the dead. That's a surgery. <laughs> That's a surgery that I cannot simply perform, the circumcision of the heart, the heart transplant. Only God is capable of performing that surgery. So listen closely again. Paul writes, never avenge yourselves, beloved. Give place to the wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And I say, well, okay. But now what if Brett is just like really a butthead? I mean, what if he really ticks me off? What if he's a jerk and God doesn't do anything about it? What do I do about my desire for vengeance? Well, if I don't discern the body, the body of Christ, wouldn't I feel the need to either fix Brett or <laughs> cut him off? 
Vengeance is to fix wrong with right. But you see, fixing Brett is just a terrible burden for me. Because I can't even begin to imagine all the things that are wrong with Brett. I mean, can you, Heather? I can't. Yeah. She can. And yet, if I get frustrated with Brett and I cut Brett off, Brett off, I, I also cut myself off. What I do to him, I also do to Jesus. And what I do to Jesus, I also do to me. Ah, oh, man, this one's... Oh, I cause all kinds of trouble in the body of Christ. <laughs> Point is, if I cut bread off, I cut me off. Where was I? Oh, yeah. But what if Brett hurt me, and yet I discerned the body? What if I stayed attached to Jesus when Brett cut himself off from me? Well, here, I've got to put this leg back in. What if Brett, imagine I'm this, Brett cut himself off from me and, and I stayed attached rather than cutting myself off? Well, then you see, I could bleed for Brett the way uh, Jesus always bleeds for me and I wouldn't run out of blood. I really, I, I really can't judge Brett, but I can constantly forgive Brett. <laughs> Aphiomi is the Greek word for it. The word is translated forgive or allow or let. In other words, I can let Brett be Brett. I can be kind to Brett. And then if he chooses to draw blood, what will I be bleeding? <laughs> the vengeance of God. So listen again. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Moreover, indeed, yes, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him some to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by the evil, but overcome the evil with the good. Now, if I'm trying to hurt Brett with kindness, it's not kindness. It's a lie about love, which is worse than flat-out hate. It's the worst of human religion. But if I discern the body and I believe the things Paul has written, well, you see, I know two things about Brett, and I know one thing about me. Number one, I know Brett is worse than I can imagine, <laughs> like me. You know, I don't think I've ever loved my neighbor as myself, except perhaps in moments that I now can't remember because I wasn't even conscious that I was doing it. But anyway, we're both arrogant illusions that think we must create ourselves, and so we crucify love, and we render ourselves incapable of love, the, the old man, the old Adam. So, so I shouldn't be surprised if once in a while Brett disappoints me, and I disappoint Brett. So number one, we are both utterly incapable of love, I know that, and number two, we are both the incarnation of love, the temple of the living God. And so we are both number one and number two and number three. I know that I am unable to judge between number one and number two. You know, Jesus taught that each one of us is like a field of wheat and tares. We can't pull up the tares without also pulling up the wheat. He said that we have to leave it like this until the end of the age. The end of the age is the day of vengeance and the beginning of the jubilee. The end of this age and the beginning of the age to come is the moment that you forgive your neighbor. It's the moment someone takes your life and you give your life, for it's not your life, it's Christ's life, which is the vengeance of God, the apocalypse. See, it's not my job to fix Brett. That's vengeance, ekdikesis, and that belongs to God. It's my job to love Brett. Decasis, righteousness. The love of God flowing through me, and that love will fix Brett. And that love will fix me. It's the life of God 
in us. So if Brett and I really want to lose the old man and become the new man, if we want to be the church, if we really want to change the world, it won't happen by reading books and trying really hard. It will happen by bumping into each other and bleeding for each other, bleeding for each other because we want to bleed for each other. Church is a community of people that present themselves as sacrifice to God in the temple that is each other. And how we change the world is by bleeding the vengeance of God, that is, feeding our neighbors, giving them something to drink, giving them something to eat, not because we have to, but because we want to. And so Jesus said, I have earnestly desired, I have so wanted to eat this Passover with you, And then he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in re remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. You see, he gave them something to eat and something to drink. And Jesus offered this to all of his disciples. Go back and read it. He offered it to Judas. And he offered it to you. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul issues something like a warning. He says this, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. By discerning the body, I don't think he meant understanding how the bread could be body. You know, that thing that we fight and divide over for like 2,000 years now, consubstantiation, transubstantiation, all that, all that stuff. I don't think he meant that. By discerning the body, I think he meant seeing the people in this room and seeing the people that you bump into out on the street for who it is that they actually are. If you don't discern the body and the blood, this will burn you like fire. If you discern the body, you will bleed for them, the people in this room, the people on the street. As Jesus bleeds for you, and you'll be joined uh, to them. Uh, and, and, and what you bleed, what you bleed, you see, is the mercy of God and also the judgment of God. You know, Jesus bled once for all at the edge of time and eternity, but now you are his body. And through you, he bleeds. Every time you're kind in this very unkind world. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, wrote Paul. Now I have all sorts of just amazing stories about how great acts of forgiveness um, they just undo people and then they make them new, make them one. But great acts of forgiveness can often be contrived, right? Pastors always try to work them so they can put them in their sermons. And so they're not always easily believed. And so I have this suspicion that one day we will see it was not a few great acts of forgiveness that transformed the world. It was countless unremembered acts of kindness. And so the king on the throne will say, Arn, you, you gave me something to drink. Kevin, Brett, you gave me something to eat. And you'll say, well, I don't remember that. And he'll say, exactly. <laughs> you weren't trying to be good. You just were good. You were bleeding me. If the kindness is conspicuous to you, but it's usually not kindness. If the love is a law, it cannot be genuine. If the forgiveness is a tool, it's not forgiveness. So how can the unkind actually become kind? There's only one way we must surrender our self-centered selves to the kindness of God. 
And that, my friends, is our logical service of worship. Amen. And so, Lord God, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Father, is Jesus your neighbor? Jesus, do you love your neighbor as yourself? Because you came and stood next to to, to me. <laughs> God, I think that means that you feel about me the way you feel about Jesus. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would open my eyes so I would feel about you the way Jesus feels about you and the way Jesus feels about the people in this room so that we could get on with the party that is reality and stop living in the darkness, weeping and gnashing our teeth. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have conquered, that you have overcome the evil with the good. And Lord God, I pray now that you would help us to believe, because we believe a little, but help our unbelief. Thank you that you will, because it is finished. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen. So we invite you to stick around uh, after the service if you'd like. Um, uh, have a wonderful week, and in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.